bad weather joke in there somewhere. So uh, we have this thing jam-packed full of goodies for you, and rumor has it there may be a couple of dragons. What? <laughs> Whoa. So watch out. Watch out. Um, but seriously, guys, thank you so much for spending all of that time waiting outside. We were so excited to see you guys when we walked in. Special shout out to our friends on the Twitch stream. Everybody wave hi to the cameras behind you. Yay. <laughs> all right. And watching live from Liverpool, England at the Grand Prix they're having right now, our friends over at uh, GP Liverpool. So big shout out to them. Thank you guys for watching. <laughs> All right, so who the heck am I? I am uh, Liz Lamfero. I'm on Magic's brand team. Um, and I'm here as your MC or host of sorts. And on our illustrious panel, to my left, is Doug Beyer, senior creative designer. Uh. I went a little bit out of order, I apologize. Dave Humphreys. Ethan Fleischer, who you might remember from the Great Designer Search 2. Hi again. <laughs> <laughs> well, before I ask Doug to walk us through cons and time travel and dragons, oh my, um, why don't we take a little look at what Sarkon has going on in Dragons of Tarkir? given a chance to change Tarkir's fate. I traveled back, back before the dragons died, and tipped the scales of history. When I returned to my time, I found you, Ugin, alive. The dragon tempest never ceased. Dragon kind never died out. The cards fell. And in their place rose five elder dragons. The dragon lords claimed their rightful place in command of the world. Five new dragon clans grew around them, forging a new history from the old. This is our world now, Ugin. This is our Tarkir. Where once the clans fought the dragons, now the dragons and the clans are one. I too have changed. I've thrown aside my own past. I'm a curiosity now, an orphan of time. But now, Takir is the world I've always longed for. Now, I fly with dragons. time travel thing for us. Doug, the real question is, will there be dragons in Dragons of Tarkir? Let's, get a, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Okay. okay. Spoiler alert. Just to okay. Know. So let's take a look at the world of Tarkir as it is now. As you recall, the last time we saw Fate Reforged, was, the, Sarkon was heading back to a time when dragons still existed. He had, had a choice to make. He had an opportunity. He was able to rescue Ugin and change the timeline. So through his actions, possibly even yours at the last pre-release, Ugin was saved. And this caused a ripple effect through history to change the, the present that we know it. So now the dragon tempest never died out. These storms that generate dragon after dragon and spawn them into the world never died out. This world now knows the glory of dragons again. Over time, the cons fell, the clans changed, and now the world is what Sarkon always hoped for, a wor world full of dragons. So each clan has organized around one of the dragon lords and is named after that dragon lord. There's Dromaka, 
who is the green-white uh, dragon clan of endurance. These dragons have impenetrable scales. The warriors of this clan fight in tightly knit groups, even have actual dragon scales on their shields and their armor. And although they don't practice the same spirit magic that the Abzan once did, there is one protective spirit that hangs around. Some have, been, have called her Anafenza. So this is, the, this is the person who was once the Khan in the alternate timeline. Now she is a spirit. She died somewhere through, through the history, and she still lingers to help out the clan. The blue-white clan of the Ojutai. This is the clan of cunning dragons, mystics, and monks. The monks of this clan seek to learn from the, their dragon leaders. They learn spells and magic and discipline from them. And one who's learned an especial amount of discipline here, so special is, the, is a word now, is Narset. In one timeline, she died fighting for Sarkhan. And in this timeline, she is not only alive, but comes back to us in a new form as a planeswalker. Now she can roam the multiverse and seek truth beyond Tarkir. The clan of Silengar, blue-black, the clan of ruthlessness. Silengar himself sits on this pile of treasure, and his clan struggles to keep him entertained so that they don't become dinner. They bring him gold, treasure, trinkets, trophies, and undead servants, one of which is the former Khan of the Sultai, Sidisi, the Naga. She is undead in this timeline, and Silmgar keeps her close as a powerful mage. The red-black Kolagon clan, this is the clan of speed with their dragons with four wings and lightning breath. The Kolagon clan struggles to keep up with the dragons above them, they move at lightning speed and they just do their best to ride as fast as they can into battle. You can see Zergo here in this piece. Uh, Zergo has had a kind of a demotion. He was once the, <laughs> the con of this clan and now he rings a bell as his whole job. He's kind of the Biff Tanner of this story. Um, <laughs> his job now is to alert the rest of the Kolagon warriors when the Kolagon dragons uh, take flight. So it's up to you whether this is a promotion or a demotion. I mean, he's a two-two for one now. I mean, in, a, in, in some timelines, that's a lot stronger. <laughs> the Atarka clan, these are a clan whose dragons are huge, fire-breathing monsters with broad antlers. The clan of the Atarka struggles to find enough food because they know that if they don't find enough snacks for their dragons, they become snacks themselves. One that uh, calls hunters to find resources and help them survive is Surak, who in this timeline calls these uh, warriors to them so they can feed Atarka herself. And in one timeline, <laughs> Surak punched bears. Now, this is Dragons of Tark here. This is we're not, we're not bear punching here. But, but there is punching. <laughs> As the clans battle each other, sometimes the, the humanoid leaders have to t take it upon themselves to take a fang out of enemy dragons when necessary. <laughs> so... This is the con. In any timeline, Surak is up for any kind of epic confrontation. <laughs> so that's our brief look at uh, Dragons of Tarkir. Now, Sarkhan has undergone a great change. He's traveled through time. He's met with Timur shamans. He has restored Ugin. He's restored dragons to the world. This for him is Christmas time. This is it's the best day of Sarkhan's life. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to be clear. Okay. I, I really I, I need to know what you're saying is that there are dragons in Dragons of Tarkir. Liz, there are tons like, of dragons. Like a, like like more like a handful? So like many dragons. <laughs> Okay, okay, 
so like I, I could like more than seriously. I seriously like Stormwing Dragon. All right, so like a lot. Okay, I get it. So Dave Humphreys, developer extraordinaire. We've got some pretty sweet looking dragons. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, what some of them do? Yeah, we, we got a lot of dragons. Uh, we have <laughs> lots of different cycles of five dragons. Um, one of our goals certainly make, to make sure that they don't all sort of blur together like that last little set of slides. So uh, for starters, we have uh, Megamorph dragons, which Ethan will be talking that, about that mechanic a little more. Um, so if you're a fan of hidden dragons, um, this is your chance to get them onto the battlefield before the later turns of the game. And what better way to surprise someone with, than with a dragon? Um, also, we have a cycle of monocolor rare dragons that have really impressive effects. Um, for example, this one, which destroys all other creatures on the battlefield. And if that's not enough for you, we still have a lot of other cards in the set that make it really valuable to play with dragons, reward you for having dragons on the battlefield and in your hand. We also have three cycles of gold dragons, so if gold is your thing, uh, there's a lot to be found here. We have uncommon rare and mythic rare cycle of dragons. Um, here's one such example, sort of doing its best to mimic uh, double prowess. Um, and then let's take a look through all the Elder Dragons in case you haven't seen those yet. So starting with Jermoka, um, she can be a real thorn in the side of both a control deck or an aggressive deck, given that she has lifelink and really shuts down your opponent doing things on your turn. She's pretty. <laughs> I like that one. Uh, and as well, we have Kulagon here, giving, you know, representing speed, giving her whole team speed. And if you're playing against her, just make sure that you take a good look at that last line of text there, or you might end up dead. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, here we have Silumgar uh, sporting some Tassigar themed jewelry. Um, <laughs> No, he's uh, very few things are a match for him. When he comes into play, he takes control of uh, any creature or a planeswalker. Um, and a Tarko. Where else are you going to see a 8-8 flying trampoline creature other than uh, in red and green? So certainly, you know, monster of the skies, dealing five damage split among uh, creatures and planeswalkers when she enters the battlefield. Um, so we have three um, new mechanics for our clans. Uh, this is actually not a new mechanic in that it's a returning mechanic from Rise of the Eldrazi. Um, it is rebound. It's uh, certainly meant to pair well with prowess, given that you can get a prowess trigger on the turn you played and on the next turn. Um, then we have Formidable, which rewards you for having a total of eight power amongst your creatures. Um, again, mimicking Ferocious before, where you needed one creature with power four. Now we want you to spread that out, but still have really big, powerful creatures. Um, and uh, here we see Exploit. Um, this is where um, the Silumgar are getting rid of the weakest of their group to produce very powerful effects or perhaps getting rid of themselves in a pinch. Um, you know, and also a fueling Delve from the, the early, earlier parts of the block. Um, here's a card that's also new to our audience. Um, this is a reminder again that we also have Bolster returning to the Dramoka clan. Um, again, spreading around plus one, plus one counters, uh, building up their weakest rather than uh, sacrificing their weakest. Um, and I should uh, mention here, as you saw with Zergo earlier, that we have Dash returning uh, to the Colgan, um, again with lots of speedy creatures. Um, here's another, uh, the, the final of the Elder Dragons. We didn't forget Ojitai. Uh, so Ojitai really representing um, a lot of things here. Uh, you'll note that she has hexproof while, uh, he, or he has hexproof while he's untapped, which means that you can really pick your battles with him um, when, when you're ready to get him into combat, ready to protect him with all of your Jeskai or now uh, Ojitai tricks um, that you, you can try to get him through. And if he gets through, uh, you get to look at the top three cards of your library and put one in your hand. Anybody want to see this card? Yes. All right. <laughs> Don't worry. The, the rest, the rest is coming. But uh, you know, as as we've alluded, uh, we have a little blue going on with Sarkon here. Um, planeswalkers are often judged on their ability to protect themselves. Uh, perhaps what better way than making red dragons to protect you? Um, if you don't need protection, how about maybe drawing some cards and adding some mana? Let's do it. 
Let's just let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> I, I think they like the card, Dave. Okay. Maybe that'll help you play all of the dragons. Should, and we, should, should we brace, the, brace ourselves? Hold on, people. <laughs> okay, uh -oh. brace yourselves. <laughs> It's a dragon set. Dragons! How about put all of those dragons into play? Do you need a, do you need a minute? Do you need to think about that? Just need a, a minute to... Oh, Sarkin. I do love me a man with some scales. <laughs> Speaking of a man with scales... I don't. I didn't have a better transition than that. I'm really sorry. I like your transitions. Uh, okay, thanks. Just laugh so I feel better about the transition. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So sorry, Ethan. <laughs> but Ethan, Khan's block has been one of my favorites to draft. Can you tell me a little bit more about this time travel story and and how this is going to play out in play formats like draft and dragons? So the whole story of the block is about time travel. It's about a man who goes back in time and changes history. And we wanted to reflect that through gameplay. So the, the seed of the entire block, the basis, the f one thing that we started from was this weird draft format where you open different booster packs at different times during the season. So back when Cons of Tarkir first came out, we were just drafting Cons of Tarkir. It was like any other set. Then we went back in time to Fate Reforged and we got to see the entire timeline from ancient history all the way up to the present and see the genesis of these clans. But then when Sarkhan went back in time and saved Ugin's life, it changed everything. And we got to Dragons of Tarkir. So now there's a new timeline. You won't be drafting any cons of Tarkir anymore, just Dragons of Tarkir and Fate Reforged representing this new altered timeline. Another way that we wanted to depict the time travel story was through game mechanics. So you can see here from Cons of Tarkir, we have Master of Pearls, a card with Morph. And we made a new mechanic called Manifest that was a more primitive, primal version of Morph. This was the magic that Ugin gave to the people of Tarkir to help them be tricky and sneak around and have a chance of competing against the dragons. But in the new timeline, they need to have a little less trickery and a little more size. And so here we have the alternate timeline version of Morph, Megamorph, where the creatures can get bigger. You can have three different states for the creature. The 2-2 two, two face down, or in this case, the 2-1 just cast normally, or cast face down and then flipped up to become a 3-2. I'm just so excited for pre-release. I can hardly stand myself. I just want to yell dragons every time <laughs> I go with a dragon. Which box are you going to take, Liz? All of them. <laughs> all I guess boxes. that's the perk of working for Wizards no. of the Coast. We get to no. take all the boxes. <laughs> no, I, but I mean, that does bring up a good point so that when you go to pre release, March 21st through 22nd, you can choose the aspect of the dragon that you loved from cons, bring that with you into the pre release experience. And in your pre release box, you'll get one of those super pretty spin down dice that are actually going to be your breath weapons because for the first time ever, you get to play as a dragon in Dragon Fury. So you'll take your, your breath weapon, you'll throw it down the board at those petty little creatures in front of you and then laugh with an evil laugh as you crush your friend's hopes and dreams by scoring more points than they do. <laughs> Plus you get the super pretty dice. One could do worse. It's a good day. But I want to shift gears. I, I want to shift gears down the calendar a little bit to Modern Masters 2015 edition. And I'm thinking you guys are kind of excited about it. Maybe. Maybe just a little. Well, what I'm most excited about in addition to the set is what some folks in the office are saying may be the world's largest face-to-face -face gaming experience. It could be. We don't know yet. So that's going to be Modern Masters Weekend. So May 29th through 31st, three Grand Prix across three different continents in Las Vegas, Chiba, Japan, and Utrecht, Netherlands. 
with coverage streamed around the clock. So no matter where you are in the globe, you can be a part of it just by playing your favorite format of Magic, hosting a viewing party, going to your local game store. It's gonna be a big moment for Magic players from all over the globe and you definitely don't wanna miss it. But the big question, Dave, the big question is not if there are dragons in it. That's not what I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna ask Doug again later. But the big question is what exciting cards are going to make a return in Modern Masters 2015? Right, so yeah, Modern Masters took a look from 8th edition through the Lara Reborn, and there's been a lot of speculation about what's, what's going to be back again. So I'm here to tell you at least one really exciting card. Uh, so yeah, some of your po favorite cards are back here. Tarmogoy, for one, uh, very frequently seen on modern uh, tables. And uh, we've moved... Now that we've gone a couple of years further in time, we have a few more uh, blocks that we're drawing upon, so both Zendikar and Scars of Mirrodin blocks, as well as some cards from Magic 2012 are showing up, so here's one such example, Card and Liberated. And I should also note, finally, that, you know, again, lots of cool stuff going on for limited, great draft and sealed experiences in this. Awesome. I'm excited about Modern Masters. It's going to be so, super fun. Super fun. So, hey... Time for another awkward transition. Speaking of planeswalkers, those pesky planeswalkers and their sparks. Concern him. Come on, laugh. That was better. <laughs> it was better than scales. All right. <laughs> laugh, don't you laugh. So Magic Origins is coming out in July, but why don't we get a sneak peek at what's in store and then we'll go to Magic Origins guru Doug Byer to find out a little bit more about each of these planeswalkers and their stories. Magic is power. It has the capacity to create and destroy, manipulate and transform. It can shatter the very laws that govern each world. The infinite planes of the multiverse are home to countless mages. Yet for all their mastery over their craft, they are each bound to their own planes of reality, blind to the true vastness of the multiverse. But some mages are born with a potential for more. The spark, this gift realized only upon facing a great ordeal. Once ignited, it allows the mage to travel between planes and draw from each plane's magic to reach heights of power otherwise impossible to achieve. They can begin their journey as a planeswalker. of Magic Origins is this moment when these mage characters transition to become planeswalkers. We're going to be able to see that moment when they shifted, when they realized their destinies, and we're going to be able to get on, in on the ground floor of a grand story that's going forward. Each of these characters is important to the future storyline. They're going to play a role, and we want to see how they started out, what motivated them from the beginning. We're going to be able to see how Gideon changed from being a young street tough to being a champion of, the, of justice and of the meek. We're going to get to see Jace's home plane. We're going to see the place that he doesn't even remember he's from and how his mind abilities, his mind magic, was used by dark forces against him. We're going to get to see Liliana pre-demonic <laughs> pre pact and post. And we'll see how she tried to make her way as a, as a young healer, and tried to master the power of death to, to keep death at bay, and how that really didn't go very well for her. And how she eventually got on a path of necromancy to finally control death. We'll see the young spunky Chandra when she grew up in a world that did not appreciate her fire magic, and how 
a tragedy became an opportunity for her to become a great planeswalker and an amazing pyromancer. And we're going to see Nyssa and how an experience, a traumatic vision occurred to her and opened her mind up to limitless possibilities, allowed her to travel the multiverse. So we're going to get to see all these characters from their, their crucial moment, that spark moment, and we're going to be able to play through that same moment with them. So now, Ethan, I know you had a big hand in how the story of these Planeswalkers played out in cards. Can you talk us through that and what that's going to look like? And maybe show us a card? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so we knew we wanted to tell these very personal stories through gameplay. That's hard to do. A lot of the stuff when we design things, we, we try to show an environment and show large groups of people, places. We need to get very personal for this one. So we were trying to figure out how can we talk about, how can we show on cards how this young healer became this powerful necromancer with armies of the undead at her command. And I did what I often do, which is say something I think is ridiculous and too hard to do, and then everyone else has to do the hard work to implement it. So <laughs> my idea was, what if we did double-faced cards, like an in Innistrad, that are a legendary creature on one side and a planeswalker on the other side? Do you, do you want to see one? Yeah. yeah? All right. Wait, I, don't, I don't know. Did, did they really want to see it? That guy back there, uh, he doesn't want to see it. <laughs> All right, well, the rest of these people want to see it, so let's go. All right, so here we have Liliana, the young Liliana in her form as a healer, legendary creature, and this tells the story about how when her brother was dying, she used radical magic that she'd never tried before to try to save his life, and it went horribly wrong and he became a zombie. This was the traumatic event that caused Liliana's spark to ignite and she became a planeswalker. So you can see here, one of your creatures is about to die, you can get a zombie token back, and then she planeswalks into the exile zone <laughs> and returns face down as Liliana, defiant necromancer. So she does some very Liliana-ish things. She makes people <laughs> discard cards. She reanimates creatures. And if you can get her all the way up to her ultimate, the dead will never rest. <laughs> so in that really killer Liliana card, along with each of the other Planeswalker cards in Magic Origins, will be playable for the first time ever in Magic Duel's Origins. So we're bringing Planeswalker cards to Duel's Origins for the first time. Um, that's a big thing. That's a big thing. So <laughs> in this edition, you'll be able to play through the origin stories of each of these five Planeswalkers. So as you as you want to see those pivotal moments in each of those characters' stories, you'll be able to play through them right in duels. Oh, we got mood lighting. <laughs> All right. Johnny and Liliana split it up there, getting a little too cozy, <laughs> little too cozy in front. <laughs> but on top of that, there's more. Two-Headed Giant is back as a play mode. I love Two-Headed Giant! Two-Headed Giant! Woo! along with thousands of AI decks, so that means that really and truly, Magic Duel's Origins is a limitless play experience. Um, the deck builder's back, you can build decks from scratch, build with archetypes, and the big, whoop, lighting's back, all right. <laughs> and all of the gameplay is 100% earnable. So that means that there, you can literally play for hours and not pay a cent. So exciting I like stuff. the sound Yay! of that. All right, Magic, Origin, Magic Duel's Origins is coming out in July of 2015. It'll be on Xbox One, PlayStation 4, Steam, and iPad. Woo! All right, so with that, we're going to take your questions. So if you can line up at each of these mics right here. 
So folks, as you're lining up, please note that we do have Sean and Allison from our social media team. They may be popping in with questions from the interwebs. And our friends at GP Liverpool, everybody wave to GP Liverpool again. Hi, Grandpa Liverpool. Hi, GP. Hello. All right, Hi, so Rick. we are going to start here on the front, my left, and please speak directly into the microphone. Hi, uh, my question is about future draft formats. In the past, we've had like Rise of the Eldrazi and Avrakan Restored, where you only drafted the last set when it came out, and now we have Fate Reforged and uh, Dragons of Tarkir being drafted together. Uh, but now we'll only have two sets in a block. Are we going to see any weird draft formats with that interaction, or is that just going to be standard? I think it's certainly possible that uh, we could mix it up occasionally, even within the two uh, set block paradigm. Um, or, you know, we don't always have to do two set blocks forever. We always have the option to mix it up if it feels like the appropriate thing to do. Thank you. All right. To our friend over there with an axe or a sword? I can't see. Oh, it's now I see. OK. <laughs> scissors. Hello? Hey, so Doug, I want an answer from you, but an answer to the Z, but I want an answer from you from this also. <laughs> Why isn't Zergo a coward? <laughs> Why isn't Zergo a coward? Uh, we, did we talk about that? It was on the table. So we, we definitely wanted to change some things about his character. He's still a warrior. He's still a member of the Kolagon clan, and he still fights that clan. He's not, well, he's more cowardly for sure in this timeline than he was in the other one. But it it was on the table. It just, we, we didn't quite get there to that, to that particular expression of the flavor. But he's not going like to block the, the his iron claw, <laughs> The Iron Claw text was something I added on as just uh, sort of wanting to put a drawback on a one mana 2-2, two, two, so, which is relatively Good question. Charging. All right, right here. Hi, so my question has to do with a new and upcoming format, uh, Tiny Leaders. Um, so my question is, do you guys have any plans in the future to make a three-casting uh, general, which is, what's it called, uh, blue and black? And, oh, no, blue, black, oh, shoot, what's it called? Blue, black, green. Uh, we don't usually design legendary creatures with specific formats in mind, but uh, it's certainly a thing that's on our radar as Tiny Leaders becomes more popular. We're certainly uh, looking for opportunities to support the format. Hi, my name is Dylan Rippey. Um, before I ask my question, I would like to um, thank you guys for starting to introduce characters who are um, identify across various spectrums, whether it be gender or um, I don't know how to, uh, I guess, yeah, I, I, the mental spectrum as well. I don't know how to put it any other way, but it's nice to see that such a popular game is expressing um, acceptance and encouraging uh, acceptance in a, all across the various spectrums. So thank, thank you. you. Th thank you for saying that. Now my actual question. Okay. <laughs> okay, real quick. Um, with the most recent Commander Precons, we went back in time and we saw some of the Planeswalkers before the Mending and they lost their spark or they changed the way that Planeswalkers work. Uh, we haven't even seen Teferi in a long time and I'm curious what he's been doing for the last couple of millennia. <laughs> Are there any plans at this point to look back into the Vorthos of those uh, of past planes and just kind of see what they've been doing? Well, let me ask you this. Is that something you would like to see? Yeah. yeah. He's, he's making a note. I, I do have a question from our, a our friends at GP <laughs> Liverpool. Thanks, Allison, for screening this. Uh, why was Nyssa chosen? What's her story? And why was Gideon chosen? Because we got a Johnny staring you down right here in the front row. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> a Johnny saying. is giving me the, the cat eye right now. Um, the reason we chose the, the characters we chose for Magic Origins is because they have an important role to play in the upcoming storyline. That does not mean that other characters are out of the story at all. We may see other characters that are not in Origins in the future, or we might not, no guarantees. But we, we, we chose these in particular because we knew they would play an essential role in, uh, in this upcoming story. Great, all right. Our gentleman here in the, my left to right. Uh, Isaac, this is a question for Doug. Uh, Popular does, fellow today. 
<laughs> does Bolas know Ugin is alive and is he mad? Was <laughs> does this play into did he have like some deeper plan and he's like he wanted Sarkin to go back and save Ugin or I don't think that Bolas has gotten the memo quite yet. Uh, unclear what his reaction would be. Um, we will see. <laughs> We will see what happens from here on out. We're just starting to scratch the surface of the Dragons of Tarkir storyline. So we're going to see more of the effects of how those changes roll out to the rest of the multiverse, and including how uh, Bolas's intention to kill Ugin might change things. So, so far, I don't think he knows, no. So stay tuned. Does Soren know? Soren, uh, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have one more question from our friends at GP Liverpool. What are the lands in Dragons of Turkey going to be like? I think we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> Is the answer wait and see? Wait and see. Okay. <laughs> oh, don't look so sad. I can tell you their art is really cool. <laughs> it's really cool. All They're right. not going to cost the any right. mana. Uh, well, my question is regarding to uh, Silumgar's jewelry. Will we, be, will we be seeing a Tassigar card in the Dragons of Tarkir? Can you repeat that one more time? My question is regarding Silumgar's jewelry. Will we, will we be seeing a Tassigar card in Dragons of Tarkir? So Tassigar, his corpse has been magically preserved for over a thousand years. Um, I think most of the time he spends his, his days in uh, like some kind of jewelry box or something. <laughs> brought out for special occasions like, like when he's going to get his, Silumgar's going to get his portrait taken. So I don't think he's really playing into the main storyline. So on Silumgar himself, that's where Tassigar lives in our hearts. So if, <laughs> if you see Allison later on, she actually made herself a Tassigar necklace. It's that's really true. super Allison cute. Allison is wearing <laughs> a, a small dead we'll, teenager we'll put a, from a thousand years ago we'll, around her neck. Yeah, We'll put a picture of it up on, on the Twitter later. <laughs> All right, yep. I just have uh, two quick questions. Uh, one, are we ever going to see a third set in the Unseries? Is that... Do you want me to take... <laughs> I take it that's something you guys would I, like I to see. I know one person Please. who really wants that to happen. <laughs> I, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to see a third Unset? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so another quick question. Uh, is there really going to be other creatures like Steamflogger Boss, and maybe we can like uh, do some contraptions, or is, is that ever going to happen, or is that just me? The thing is, questions about the future are kind of hard for us to answer. Is okay, that thank you for your you question. Like I'll, take, I'll take that. Thanks. <laughs> What do you think is the best planeswalk? Ooh. <laughs> hey, do you want to come see, see a Johnny? I think he's got a good answer for you. <laughs> How what, old are you, buddy? Why don't we each talk about which, which one is our favorite? My favorite <laughs> is Tezzeret the Seeker. <laughs> Tezzeret? Well, who's yours? I, mean, I gotta go with Sarkon in this set. So. Well... I gotta say my favorite's Nyssa because she's kind of awesome and you should wait for Magic Origins. I like, okay, Nyssa as a character because she's more than just her cards. She is a very deep, rich character. I, I, I'm a Chandra person. Chandra is my girl. Lily, we love you. So I'd like you to know your favorite Planeswalker. Jace. Thank Jace. you very much. Awesome. Woo. Everybody loves good a choice, classic Jace. Thanks, dude. All right, right here in the front. Hey, Doug. Uh, anyone can answer this question, really. What artifact would you bring into real life for yourself? <laughs> so what artifact would I bring into real life? Um, can it be an artifact creature? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Okay. Um, Any artifact. I don't know. The Marari's tempting. Uh, just wish, wish granting power corrupting artifact that you know dares you to screw up your entire world with it that, that would that would be high on my list i think <laughs> i'm gluttonous and i'm gonna say all of them i just want to take all the artifacts and just mess up everybody's entire board state <laughs> all the time about dark steel colossus just said you know see what <laughs> want to see what the world could do oh man what about power armor you could ride around in that one that's true 
All right, so we did have another question from GP Liverpool. They want to know if time travel is in, if that is impacting any other planes besides Tarkir. So we're going to go into this more uh, in the coming weeks, but here's the deal. The time travel that uh, Sarkhan underwent on Tarkir definitely affects the timeline of Tarkir. Anything that happens outside the bounds of Tarkir is only affected in that planeswalkers have gone there. So you won't see ripple effects that have to do with this particular uh, time travel change. However, uh, as you might have seen in the video, Sarkhan mentions that he's an orphan of time, that he's an oddity now. Uh, Sarkhan wasn't born now. That, that's that's kind of weird. So his parents never met in Dragons of Tarkir, and yet here he is. He remembers being born in the Khans timeline, and yet here he is in a place where he his parents never met. So he's just an anomaly now. With scales. He, yeah, he's also got scales. He's also in three colors now. So there's some weird things largely localized around Sarkhan himself. We'll go into this more in the coming weeks. All right, our friend in the awesome hat. <laughs> I'm a big fan of the Penny Arcade pins that you guys do. And I was just curious, what goes into deciding which Planeswalker gets to be on the pin? That is some a... of the biggest ones haven't been made yet. Say that last part again. Some of the uh, biggest, most popular Planeswalkers, like the two on the front row, have yet to be made into a pin yet. <sighs> so many pins and so many Planeswalkers. <laughs> No, it, it, is a, it is a tough call to, every time. I mean, we, as a team, we sit down from folks in the brand team with folks in, on R&D and creative and figure out what the right face to put out is at that time. We always want to make sure that it's lining up with what you guys are seeing in stores and what you're seeing um, going on in the Magic storyline right now. So that's why you have the awesome Sarkhan on Broken Pin. We love the relationship we have with Penny Arcade. Um, it really brings new life to our characters. And I wouldn't say never to those two lovelies being on a pin. So, great question. So, given how you're looking back at Planeswalkers and Origins the way that, in a similar way that you've sort of, well, it makes me think of a lot like the mending, how you went back uh, several years ago and sort of redid the way that your Planeswalkers worked. Um, I was gonna, I was wondering if Origins is any, is it all similar in that we're perhaps depowering or repowering or at all changing how planeswalkers work outside of just the cards? No, this is, this is uh, merely a look at the straightforward uh, origin stories of these characters. So a couple of these characters were actually born before the mending. Liliana was born pre-mending. She just was. Um, so she, she's, she's been around a, a while. I mean, a long time. A while, sorry. She... Uh, um, so, but we're not using this up as an opportunity to redo the rules regarding Planeswalkers. This is just a look back at the crucial events that made these characters the Planeswalkers they are. So storytelling about Planeswalkers is going to remain the same? Yes, uh, storytelling is the main thrust here. So we're, we're, you know, you'll see cards in the set that are not just the, the, like the Liliana card you saw there, but also other cards that represent characters and places and, and important events in Liliana's life and on her path to becoming a Planeswalker. Thank you. So, uh, when Ojutai took over, right, uh, all of the Dragon Slayers were, were killed. So, that would, that would seem to imply that at zero point in any time at all, Narset had a Dragon Slayer ancestor in a thousand years. That's a lot of ancestors. Just I, so, yeah, th like th it. There, there's, there's definitely a bit of uh, poetry to, the, to the, the lineups we wanted to make. We knew that, realistically, if you killed a dragon, you know, sorry, saved a dragon and had a bunch of other dragons live, uh, that would cause massive changes to the plane. And you're going to see a lot of different changes. But in order to make sure that you felt like you saw how individual changes played out, we wanted to have some of the same characters recur. So, we, so you'd, be, you'd be able to, instead of just seeing, uh, here's some cons, here are some legends in this set, and then here's a radically different set of people over here, it would be hard to detect that difference, you know? So we did repeat a lot of the characters. Yes, Zergo was still born. He was still named Zergo. It's, you know, yes. So there, there's a little bit of license there, and uh, the purpose was to help illustrate th those correspondences better. Hi. Uh, so I'm a big fan of like black-aligned heroes and anti-heroes and white villain, white-colored villains. 
Uh, are those still a possibility on the horizon? You don't have to get any specifics, but just if they're still a cool thing you guys can do. That's something we intend. Awesome. Great. Okay. <laughs> I love Soren. <laughs> All right, let's kick it over to the right-hand side. All right, so for the past several blocks, you guys have been doing a really great job with flavor, uh, mostly through the short stories on the Arcana, on the Mothership, those sorts of things. Do you have any plans to compile any of those either into print form or in an ebook form so you could take an entire plane's worth of short stories and actually have something that you could refer to, that you could, you could pull out and kind of see them all strung together? That's something we have thought about. Uh, is that, I mean, would there be interest in such a thing? So. Yes. It, it's worth investigating. I, I, I'm not going to say definitely yes, but we have considered at least an ebook format for gathering up some of the Uncharted Realm stories and, and uh, flavor bits like that. It, um, it's definitely something we've chatted about. There's just a lot of complexities in the way, and we'll have to see. But thanks for the input. All right, gentlemen here on left. Hey, uh, I'm a really big fan of the changes to the modern ban list recently, both the bans and the unbans. I think it's interesting that you have a format that you seem to be sort of actively curating with bans and unbans. And I wonder if you're going to plan on maybe experimenting more in the future, maybe being like, we're going to unban the artifact lands for exactly a year. This ban will expire. Well, look, I was going to say Stoneforge Mystic because she's sitting in the back. <laughs> she's back! But please, we got to keep it reasonable. Also, shout Hi, out to that Stoneforge. Stoneforge Mystic, how you doing? Get her on camera, seriously. Good to see you, honey. <laughs> We miss you. We miss you. <laughs> but yeah, any thoughts of maybe taking a more experimental, like short-term unbans, short-term bans, or just crazy unbanning approach to modern? Um, I mean, in, in just more general than modern, I mean, we, we've considered more out-of-the-box solutions like that. Um, but in, in general, again, we're real, really happy with where modern's at right now. I think if, if anything, we'd like to be providing stability to modern and, um, you know, not having people worry about bans. But, you know, as we've shown, if, if stuff is just making for worse gameplay or making less people less likely to want to show up to tournaments, we will take action. But, um, yeah, I think right now we don't need much out of the box in terms of, you know, most of our formats are looking really good right now, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Don't take my question as, like, not faith in you <laughs> yeah. because you're doing great. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, do, right. I do think that one of the appeals of modern is that you can make a deck and you get to keep playing your favorite deck. And so shaking it up too much makes people unhappy. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, Hi. Hey, uh, Tarkir did a lot of things. Into the microphone. Tarkir did a lot of things uh, pretty radically with the storyline with like, um, hey, these things can also be Elder Dragons or hey, time travel can also work like this. When you do something that's, I don't want to say retcon, but maybe something that's like different than the patterns that have formed in Magic, how, when do you decide like, this is okay to do or this is the time we're going to do that? We look at whether there are a sizable enough group of people who would, who would get a kick out of it. So I've been hearing lots of feedback. I get a, I get a lot of mail. <laughs> um, and there are people who are like, why did you mess with this? Why, why did you leave? You know, my expertise has been threatened because you've made these changes. I, I totally get that, and I actually respect that. Um, we also want to hear from the people who haven't been able to own an Elder Dragon that, that, you know, since Legends. Like, the availability, we've seen magic grow so much, we want to be able to reach out and have cool things for the people who are playing right this second. So we're, we're weighing those things against each other that way. We're always looking to see whether, uh, you know, are we going to um, anger a couple of people and, and excite a whole bunch of people? Then, then it's something we'll definitely consider. Thank you. Good question. All right, let's right over here. Um, hi, I just wanted to start out by saying thank you for coming all the way to the East Coast for this. Oh my gosh. <laughs> These guys got in at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock last night. And this guy barely made it because he was stuck on the tarmac in D.C. So yeah. I don't it's know what kind so of, I don't know what kind of snow, snow. y'all got here in the Northeast, but it ain't normal. <laughs> we're, 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 <laughs> we're from the weird coast, sorry. Yeah. I spent eight years in Boston, so well, it's okay. Well, well, I had a bigger question and a smaller question. The bigger okay. question is... Big question. The bigger question is, Mark Rosewater talks a lot about New World Order on his blog and in his articles, and I was, think, and I was wondering, uh, how does the two-block structure affect New World Order? Is it going to allow for more or less complexity, or is it just going to waver a little bit? I believe that... Um New World Order is all about complexity, managing complexity, 
And I believe that the two block structure allows us to have a few more mechanics in a year's time than we would otherwise. If we only had one block in a year, we could only have a block's worth of mechanics. And with two blocks, we can have two blocks worth of mechanics, maybe not quite as many as we would in the three set block, but I think overall it allows us to do more things in a smaller amount of time. And my tiny question is, with all the talk of Planeswalkers, why no love for Tybalt? <laughs> Nobody loves Tybalt. Poor Tybalt. So stylish. Tybalt's pretty sassy. He is the swankiest of the Planeswalkers. He is the swankiest, yes. And, and, yeah. I He's like very suave. So there's your non-answer <laughs> answer. <laughs> all right, yes. So, story question for Doug. Um, it's been established that uh, the title Sarkhan is a title um, that uh, Sarkhan started going by because of the dragon voice in his head from Ugin, and that his given name was Vol. But in the original timeline before it was changed and he was never born, when he was a member of the clan formerly known as Mardu, what was his war name? So I don't think he ever took a war name. Sarkhan moved up through the ranks of the Mardu and became a, a great military leader, and yet he never actually cared about the, the traditions of his own clan. He never quite fit that well into the Mardu. So, I mean, he called himself something that's kind of heretical, which is Sarkhan, meaning Great Khan, which is kind of like saying, I'm the super president. You know, like, that's, that's my name now. I'm just going to call myself super president. Can I, can I do that? Yeah, Great. you can, but unless I'm the actual president. president is in the room. I mean, he takes offense. So uh, there, there was no actual war name beyond Sarkhan. In, in a way, that was his... Uh, naming of himself is taking that title. So he had started hearing the voices from Ugin while he was still on Tarkir initially? Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, wow, time travel. Um, <laughs> there, there's a hilarious chart in my cubicle. <laughs> it's really funny. I'll have to share some details of it at some point. Um, it has to do with exactly when he was uh, on, the, on the first timeline, the point he went back, and then him zooping back to the present again. Zooping? And zooping is a technical uh, chronological term. Great. So he was hearing dragon voices early enough in the original timeline that he was calling himself Sarkhan while he was still a member of the Mardu clan. He was hearing... He, I don't know that he was hearing them before his spark ignited. Um, boy, let's talk about this we, afterwards. Yes. <laughs> I think we can get into the weeds Stick on this one. Stick around afterwards and we'll, we'll, okay. we'll talk about that. Thank you that. for your question. All right. Yes, yeah, right up here. Yeah, I just had a question about uh, the core sets. Now that they're uh, all done, are you going to put more uh, Planeswalkers in the regular sets? Because usually the core sets had like five in them, and now we're just going to have like one or two per set. Are you going to like kind of compensate? So sure. are we going to put, the question was, are we going to put more Planeswalkers into sets afterwards? I, it really depends on the story and what the story is calling for at that point. Um, one of the things that's really important to know with Magic Origins is this is the chance to really get to know these five characters and, and follow them for a while. But there may be other Planeswalkers that come in and out of that storyline. Um, but you'll have to stay tuned for more to find yeah, out. I, mean, I, I can add that we'll be trying to keep roughly the same number of Planeswalkers in standard, um, if that helps answer the question okay. as well. Yeah. So. Thank you. Over here. Hey, so uh, as of right now, we have creatures that have two types. And I, I, actually, uh, could a Johnny and Liliana stand up and do like an action pose together? These this guys look help. awesome. If you haven't seen them yet, can you, can you two stand up? requesting an action pose of you Action guys. pose, Liliana, Johnny. Isn't it? That's so amazing. So when are we going to, when are we actually going to have two planeswalkers on the same card? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, that is something that is technically allowable in the rules. That is, you know, there's something that is, you could put two subtypes on a Planeswalker <laughs> card. Um, it's not something we want to do too, uh, it's, there's the, one of the issues is that the Planeswalker in the art doesn't get to be as much of a star. The, the frame is actually kind of optimized for a single figure. Um, it's something we have talked about. Okay. Thank you. Hey, um, I have two questions. My first is, is Nahiri going to become important, and is she even alive still? You're asking whether uh, Nahiri is alive, and what was your first question again? Going to become important to the story? Um, I don't think we've seen the last of Nahiri. Okay, the second question is, <laughs> I think on one of those slides I saw Ugin. Is there going to be a second version of him? Of Ugin? So Ugin's uh, star card was in Fate Reforged. You have now seen... Uh, the two Planeswalker cards in Dragons of Tarkir, Narset and alternate form Sarkhan. Okay, thank you very much. All right, over here. 
Uh, the last time uh, you guys did double-faced cards was during Innistrad block. Uh, and for drafting an Innistrad block, uh, you, everybody would get one double-faced card in their pack. Uh, everyone would see what each person's double-faced card was. Uh, that was information that was known to everybody. How is that? Are you planning to change anything for Magic Origins with the double-faced Planeswalker cards? Is there going to be a double-faced card in every pack, or is that just going to be the Planeswalkers? So we don't talk about our, our how we spread those things out. Um, I would encourage you to play with friends who will play fairly. Um, but then sleeves are a great option for that, um, depending upon how you're going to end up playing them, so that, that's always an option. And, you know, I think it's going to be pretty obvious once you have a planeswalker in your hand, because your face is going to just light up and grin <laughs> quite a bit. Will you be putting checklists into the packs? Checklists uh, will be there. Okay. Yeah. So, um, we have time for one more question, and then we're going to have to end. So, to the gentleman uh, on my left. I'm very lucky. All right. Uh, thank you. First thing, you guys are awesome. Second thing, um, fetches are very controversial, and when you guys were you know, plan to reprint, reprint the old fetches and bring them in. Was it a difficult decision for you guys? Because the shovel time adds to games, but also, like, they're expensive, so... Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. certainly, like, shuffling is a big deal. Like, shuffling is hard for newer players, something that's easy to lose sight of. Um, shuffling adds time to, you know, our eSports games. It adds time to just matches people are playing, so... Definitely a big consideration, but you know we have to weigh that against the fact that um, these are cards that we felt like we, we wanted to make more accessible just to modern players in general. And, and yeah. Great. All right, well, thank you guys very much. <laughs> but before you go, before you go, one more thing. Yeah. Get ready. Oh, yeah.